Hi, everybody. Welcome to The Patty Brennan Show. This show is for those of you who want to protect, grow, and use your assets to live your very best lives. Today, we're going to be having an important conversation about a disease that affects all of us. It's the impact of Alzheimer's, not just on the individual themselves, but the family and society as a whole. And what can we do to arrest this awful disease once and for all? Joining me today is Dr. Jason Karlowicz. Jason has written an amazing book. It's called The Problem with Alzheimer's, How Science, Culture, and Politics Turned a Rare Disease into a Crisis. And what can we do about it? That's what I loved about this book. I read it over the weekend and last night. And if you're watching this, you're going to see that I have the book here with post-it notes all throughout. I mean, there was such good information dating back, going through the history of the disease, you know, the starts and the stops, what we've discovered, um, things that, that don't work, and maybe a few things that could. Jason, thank you so much for joining us today. Well, you're so welcome, Patty. It's a pleasure to be on the show. And by the way, everybody, you should hear Jason's pedigree. For example, he's the professor of medicine, medical ethics, and health policy, and neurology. I mean, Jason, I'm not sure how you're doing all this, but it's amazing, at University of Pennsylvania. And he's also co-director of the Penn Mem Memory Center. So you can't get a better expert on this disease than Dr. Jason Karlowicz. So, well, thank you. <laughs> with that, let's just start from the beginning. I understand that Alzheimer's, the first symptom of Alzheimer's, is memory loss. Well, I don't know mm -hmm. about anybody listening to the show, but there are a lot of times that when I'm wondering, am I beginning to lose it here? Um, how do you different? How do we differentiate between the mild cognitive impairment (MCI) versus dementia versus Alzheimer's? Yeah, let's unpack that. Great question. Let's start with the most basic question that is probably the most common question. What's the difference between Alzheimer's disease and dementia? Simply put, dementia describes someone who has developed disabling cognitive impairments. So they have trouble with memory, attention, concentration, multitasking. And those problems with those cognitive abilities are causing them to have disabilities, meaning troubles doing their daily tasks. Early on, those troubles are things like managing money, uh, deciding what restaurant to go to, traveling to the restaurant, getting the menu, picking what you want to order, and then paying the bill and calculating the tip. All those are cognitively intense tasks, and someone with dementia has trouble doing them. They need someone else to help them. So that's dementia, disabling cognitive impairments. Alzheimer's disease is a disease of the brain that causes dementia. It's not the only disease of the brain that causes dementia. Another common disease of the brain that causes dementia is a disease called Lewy body disease. That's what Robin Williams, the comic actor, had. He had Lewy body disease. There's another disease called frontal temporal lobar degeneration. Very different disease, but in the end, the common problem, if you will, is dementia. So that's the difference between Alzheimer's disease and dementia. Alzheimer's disease that causes dementia. But then you threw in mild cognitive impairment. <laughs> yeah. What's that? And that's it. In the book, I recount the history of mild cognitive impairment. It's a relatively recent concept. It's only about, well, 20 years old um, when that concept was premiered in the medical literature. And what mild cognitive impairment describes is an individual who has cognitive impairment that's causing inefficiencies in daily activities. They take longer to do things that they used to do if you will, quicker. They may make a mistake, but then they catch it. Um, that's MCI. And just like dementia, a host of different diseases can cause mild cognitive impairment. One of those diseases is Alzheimer's disease. And so one of the points I make in the book is, you know, once upon a time, you had to have dementia to be diagnosed with Alzheimer's. About the turn of the century, the advances in this idea of mild cognitive impairment began to allow someone to be diagnosed with Alzheimer's before they had dementia when they only had mild cognitive impairment. But again, if you've got a label of mild cognitive impairment, that doesn't mean that you have Alzheimer's disease. The next question is, well, what's causing my mild cognitive impairment? It might be Alzheimer's. It might be another disease. It might frankly be 
um, some of the extremes of aging together with a host of other things that can impair cognition. So MCI needs a workup, if you will. It's, um, and, and, and that's the kind of thing we do when we see folks at the memory center here at the University of Pennsylvania. Do you find that MCI automatically progresses? Does, does it always get worse? or No, it, it depends stabilize? on the cause. Okay. Exactly. It depends it. on the cause. It depends on the cause. So, you know, in well-done studies of persons with mild cognitive impairment, um, depending on how they define it, et cetera, over time, depending on issues of definition and whatnot, about half develop further cognitive problems and develop dementia. And that's because they have a disease. And about the other half don't really change much. Um, some even revert. And again, it reflects that these are heterogeneous cause causes causing these problems. So again, if there's one thing I would say to your listeners, if you're told someone has dementia, it doesn't mean they have Alzheimer's. It means they have a disease. It might be Alzheimer's. It might be Lewy body disease. It might be vascular disease. Same thing with MCI. They may have a disease, but also given the subtleties of MCI, they may not have a disease. All the more reason to get those kind of conditions worked up and not just simply go with the label. Yeah. So, Jason, when you use the word words worked up, how exactly is that done? I mean, one of the things that I didn't didn't share with you is that in my former life, I used to be an intensive care nurse. And mm -hmm. what we what we learned is that the only time that you can you really have a definitive diagnosis is on autopsy. So, so a definitive diagnosis of Alzheimer's, you're right. Once upon a time and for a long time, that was how you could just tell someone that the cause of their dementia was Alzheimer's, which, of course, is somewhat ghoulish because what you're essentially saying to the patient is until you die, I won't be able to tell you definitively whether you had Alzheimer's or not, which, of course, means I won't be able to tell you. Hence the ghoulish aspect of it. And, and that's because it's not until you get the brain of the individual and slice it up and look under the microscope can you see the characteristic pathologies that are seen with Alzheimer's. The advances, though, that have occurred, and I talk about this in the book, that are rather spectacular, is that we can now visualize those pathologies in a living human being. We can do brain scans, PET scans in particular, and also analyses of spinal fluid that can visualize the pathologies that cause someone um, to develop uh, dementia. And that's a set of technologies that are available now, but variably available for reasons largely related to the quality or lack of quality of our healthcare system when it comes to the diagnosis and care of older adults with cognitive problems. I would imagine that a lot of people would be reticent to get that diagnosis. I would Absolutely. Yeah. I would think that they would be almost afraid, like, oh, my goodness, I'm going to be labeled as having dementia. People are going to treat me differently. That's exactly right. What yeah. What are your thoughts on that? Are there advantages, or is this thing just going to progress? It is what it is, and you're going to have to <laughs> that figure phrase. it out, right? <laughs> so there's two things that we're talking about here, um, really. One of them is um, uh, uh, we're sort of we are talking about stigma. Mm -hmm. Stigma meaning a mark on someone um, that when other people when other people know that mark, they treat that person differently. They separate from them, they distance from them, they stereotype them. And certainly, if there's any one disease that enjoys, sadly, high-octane stigma, it's Alzheimer's disease. And the reason why we care about stigma are many. Number one, the well-being of the person is labeled. But number two, the issue you just raised, which is when a disease is haunted by stigma, people are reluctant to find out if they have the disease. They, they avoid the places where the disease is diagnosed. And that's understandable. You know, stigma creates a sense of revulsion, and distancing, et cetera. So stigma is a very real problem in Alzheimer's because you've got patients, frankly, people out there who have problems but just won't get them worked up and refuse to see it, um, have it worked up because of stigma. Um, so that's one problem right there. Um, you know, uh, uh, then the question is, you know, how do we combat stigmas? You know, what and, and what can we do to do that? And well, one way we do that is we have conversations like this. We raise awareness in the community. You know, read my book, <laughs> dare I say. You know, mm -hmm. because I think the more something is discussed and talked about, the less stigmatizing it is. Um, you know, having said that, though, you know, um, uh, uh, there are real advantages to getting a diagnosis and to getting a diagnosis early. And I think this is why you and I have come together, in fact, because some of the earliest problems 
in, with cognitive impairment, they're not troubles with bathing, dressing, grooming, and feeding, late stage problems. They're troubles doing very sophisticated cognitive tasks. And what's one of those pro- tasks? Managing your money. You betcha. Paying your bills. You know, all those things that require what we call in my field, higher cortical function. And early on in this disease, they are impaired. And the sad, the tragedy of patients who don't get a diagnosis is early on, they have these impairments, they start making mistakes, they get defrauded, they lose money, and it just becomes this disaster by the time they finally get worked up. Agreed. It is one of the things I think... Um, what I understand with Alzheimer's is is that especially in the beginning, you can have good days and not so good days. And oh, that absolutely. makes it even worse. It makes it even more difficult. Oh, well, you know, yeah. you're married to somebody and oh, well, they're just ha- not having a good a, a good day. And then you find out three months later that, you know, they made an investment in some random, you know, offshore yep. thing and all of your money is gone. Those exactly. are very real stories. People need to understand that, that the the awareness, just face it, you know, face these things because there are things that you can do to protect yourselves and Absolutely. help the person. That's Even if is. there's not a treatment, and there is a treatment out there now, which we can talk about, and I think it's a very debatable um, and controversial treatment. But even before the FDA approved that drug, which uh, mm-hmm. uh, uh, will some soon be available perhaps, but even before that, there were real concrete things you can do. And in the book, I talk about this. And, you know, people, and, and the word I use is, is planning. And they say, oh, what do you mean planning? Like, you know, whether I get on a ventilator or not, get CPR. No, 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 no. What I'm talking about is planning like, I'll speak personally. If I had cognitive problems, let's say I had MCI, I would want to have a plan in place that someone's watching over how things are going with my money. Emphasis on the watching over, not managing it, not joint on all the accounts so they can defraud me, but able to watch over and say, you know what, Um, actually, you know, you already paid that bill or um, you've bought that thing twice or, you know, wait a minute, what's this purchase? You know, a 20 20 year maturing security and you're 90 years old. (laughs) You're not going to see that mature in time probably. So let's have a conversation. And, and, you know, same thing around um, driving. You know, you can pick a number of very important activities in daily life that you want to plan in place to monitor. And if things are detected, someone can step in and help who you trust. If you wait for a fire, well, you know you're going to burn some part of the house down, but instead you can put in alarms and other systems that the place might not catch on fire, or if it does, it'll get taken care of very quickly. And that's the model, I think, that has existed. Unfortunately, though, most patients and family members don't have access to that kind of education, skill building, because of the limitations of our healthcare system. It is so interesting because as you were talking, I was thinking, boy, I hope my colleagues are listening to this podcast. I hope well, the they financial should, yeah, advisors are on the front there. line. Yeah. Exactly. Because <laughs> we are, you know, we know our clients. We know what's normal for them and what's not normal. And I will tell you, it has come up. Someone will come into me and say, you know, Patty, I was just speaking with so and so, and something just didn't seem right. Or they've been asking for, you know, more distributions from their portfolio than ever before. Or um, we'll get a call from the CPA and the CPA will say, you know, these people, have, this person has not filed their taxes. They're not giving me the information. Something's not yep. right. And it just raises that red flag to dig a little deeper. Let um, me speak personally in my own, certainly in my clinic. And I recount them in my book, in my practice. But frankly, I'm going to be candid in my own family. You know, I have witnessed just that, that the earliest signs and symptoms were things that the tax accountant and the investment manager were picking up. And I'll tell you in my own personal story, frankly, I finally called um, those folks um, and they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, no, I've noticed stuff. Now, I was on top of it early on because I'm, you know, it's my gig. It's what I do. It's your gig. It's more than a gig. But I thought to myself, how many other of your clients are doing this and you're just watching this happen? And I thought, wow. (laughs) Yeah. You know, it's very interesting what what 
we do as a practice, whenever we take on a client, the first thing that I do is have them sign a form that gives us permission to speak with someone in their family. We don't necessarily give them any personal information, et cetera, but a trusted person within their family if we notice something isn't quite right. Because I that want to, is good practice. I want to get it up front while they're healthy, while they understand, and they're in agreement that that's probably you know the best thing to do it's it's really we're just looking out for them we're looking out for their family uh and making sure that you know whether it be financial damage or or otherwise as you as you said you know some of these people should not be driving a car um and that's really important for them to know that we care more about them than their money yeah well you know i mean the issue here especially with this disease is you know from diagnosis to death um, it can last as long as 10 years, very variable, but let's set that aside. If we're talking about a chronic disease, we're talking about a disease, which early on persons need help. And as they get more disabled, they need more help. And in America, that means help that you get because you paid for it. So the one thing you don't want to do is go into your retirement with a pile of cash, lose it because of fraud and other bad investments, and then have all, and then go into developing worsening cognitive problems because then it's either the family or the state that has to step in and pay for the stuff that you could have paid for. Um, and so that's why this sort of disease ramifies across families and into society because of the cost of the long-term care paid for mostly now by Americans' families. Um, but I think something that also needs to be addressed at the policy level, of course. Yeah, it, it was so interesting that one story that you told in the book about the gentleman whose wife was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. He met with his advisors and his advisors basically gave him three alternatives. Number one, you could put all of your assets into an irrevocable trust and lose control of that money forever. You're going to have to ask for a dollar to buy a newspaper. You can't do any of that yourself. You're going to have to ask a separate person, an independent person. So it's an irrevocable loss of control. That was option number one. Option number two was, hey, you could get a divorce. Yep. Divorce your spouse, and that person will receive some of the assets and then eventually go through it, and then they will qualify for Medicaid. By the yep. way, that first option, which is the irrevocable trust, is kind of a, a, a way to try and qualify for Medicaid. Now, for anybody listening to this podcast, please understand the rules of your state and the fact that there is typically a five-year look back if you do uh, attempt to pauperize yourself in this in this fashion. I will tell you, I'm going to come clean with all of you listening. I'm not a big fan of those things at all. I think it's, first of all, both of these things have a little bit of a moral, you know, ramification. It, it just kind of walks that fine line. Um, and it's typically not in your best interest to do either as well. So option one, option two, option three, of course, is just pay as you go and hope you don't and run out of money. just keep on paying until you hope you don't run out of money. And that's what he chose to do. Mm -hmm. And that, that guy, I remember him well, um, husband. And, you know, he managed to, to he, they managed to get through it um, with a lot of assets lost. In fact, uh, she was an early onset case. That is to say, her age of onset was before the age of 65, which is uncommon. And so that family faced a lot of the strains related to loss of income for retirement as well as for supportive adult children, beginning careers, education, et cetera. Um, and so this is why the disease ramifies, ramifies into the American family, because you've got um, savings that you need to do things like um, uh, pay for your well-being in retirement, support the education of other family members, uh, et cetera. And when that's hoovered up by the cost of long-term care, which can get into triple digits, um, depending on the severity of uh, uh, triple thousand digits, depending on the severity of disability, for the average American family, that's a cost that um, can be, frankly, bankrupting or at least financially un un destabilizing. And again, you know, most Western nations, Germany, et cetera, have a long-term care social insurance program to minimize that risk upon the well-being of, an, of the families. We don't have that in this country. In this country, you just pay until you go, until you qualify for Medicaid, meaning you develop, you meet poverty thresholds, and then the state will step in and help out. I don't think that that's acceptable because um, I think that's putting the American family in the front line of a risk that they shouldn't face for their finances and well-being. 
Well, I think it's also really short-sighted, too, because you think... As a society. Yeah. You think yeah. about the cost of this disease and the impact on our economy and the impact on those families, and you think, geez, you know, if we could just cover it, the impact wouldn't ne- be nearly as great. Uh, exactly. And, that's, and that conversation is lost in policymaking circles, because I totally agree Long-term care social insurance will be expensive. It will require an additional payroll tax. Absolutely. But the problem right now is is that the American family is paying off the books. So I have family members who will tell you, I cut back on work. I left the workforce. I didn't advance as far as I could have at work because I had to take care of my mother, my father, my husband. Even folks who are retired will say, well – less assets to transfer to the next generation because we're spending it on this. No so question. so it's a hidden cost in the American economy. And so, you know, the standard complaint oftentimes from one side of the aisle is this will require raising taxes and cost billions and billions of dollars. I'm like, we're already spending the billions of dollars. It's costing our economy in terms of efficiency and productivity. So why don't we just be honest and face the problem like adults do and say, you know, we're going to have to band together, put in a payroll tax, raise the funds, and provide that cushion of long-term care social insurance for the American family that needs it. Germany does it. Japan does it. Uh, uh, other de- France does it. For some reason, we just don't want to do it as a country. And it's a very effective solution because it works. When you have social insurance, because private insurance, as you well know, is also out there. It is really, really expensive, and most people can't afford it. And or just when they get to the point where they're ready to make a claim in their 70s or their 80s, the cost of it is skyrocketing and they can't afford to make the premium payments. So it yeah. lapses. So that's And not most working. of those policies only kick in when you're really disabled. I mean, I look at some of the policies people have and they're sort of like, oh, look at this. I'm covered. I'm like, well, yeah, but it only really is going to pay for a home health aid to help with bathing, dressing, grooming and feeding which is the last few years of the disease. Meanwhile, you've got about five or six years of needing supervision, um, an adult day um, activity program, et cetera, and none of those costs are covered by this policy. So, you know, a lot of policies are sort of, you know, a lot of hat but not much mm-hmm. cattle. Yeah, it's, it's the question of is it hands-on care or standby care? Yeah, and it's the standby care that you really need. I mean, for many of my family members – you know, or and uh, what the care that they need until someone really is having trouble with mobility is, you know, I, I need someone around during the day. I can't be there all the time. And that person's going to be there to help that person live a day that's safe, social and engaged. And, you know, that's a very different role than someone who's going to bathe, dress, groom, feed and toilet someone. And, you know, families struggle to find that kind of person. Again, I can tell you personally, you know, my family struggled to find someone. We finally did. But, you know, um, the, the system isn't in place to, to access that kind of person. I'm just, again, fortunate, given my expertise, that I kind of knew what to look for and how to find it. I pity. I really pity the, Mar- the average American family who has to struggle with this disease. Yeah, I do, too. It's really hard to watch. I think about the isolation, you know, that stigma really carries on. And, and you know, for the whole family, the spouse, etc., they become that much more isolated. A, they have to be there all the time to take care of that person. And, and you know, and other people aren't coming around as often. Um, yep. So difficult. So very, very difficult. I really am interested to learn more about the concept of social insurance. And again, these problems, I'm going to be kind of casual here. They drive me nuts because there is a solution. Come on. You know, uh, we were talking about this again before we came on broadcast. And and it's so interesting with COVID-19. You throw enough money at a problem, you can solve it. I mean, look at where we are today. And I know that Alzheimer's is is, is a much more complicated disease. Um, but we, if we come together as a nation and say, okay, we don't know whether or not we're going to be directly affected by this, but if we are, there's going to be other Americans who are going to help us in the form of this social insurance that will help us provide the care that we, we need. Yeah, no, I, I think COVID gives us a, COVID was a wake up call, but vast problems that ramify across society needs a united social approach um they're not problems that are solved by the grit of the individual the grit of the individual is needed but it's only part of the solution and you're right i mean 
What are these problems? The word I use to describe them is they're humanitarian problems. You know, they cut across disciplines and uh, 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 they ramify outside of just the medical space. And you have to approach humanitarian problems united and with a kind of top down, all hands on deck approach. We did it with COVID, more or less. There were moments there where things got a little weird. But, <laughs> um, you know, but we can do it with Alzheimer's disease. That is to say dementia. Um, but we just have to be united in that. And I have a hope. I mean, America has an Alzheimer's plan. Um, it's not as well known, unfortunately, as it should be. But it has resulted in some progress, uh, particularly in better understanding the biology of the disease and developing diagnostics and treatments. Um, progress has been a little uneven on care, but it's better than what the alternative was, which is zero progress in that space. So you've mentioned this Alzheimer's plan a couple of times. What exactly is it? I'm not familiar yeah, with so, it. Yeah, no, most Americans aren't, which I think is unfortunate because I think it leads to this sense of desperation that we're not doing anything. And I think it's one of the variables that, um, unfortunately, I think led to the FDA decision to approve aducanumab, namely this sense of desperation. But in a, around about 2011 or so, President Obama signed into law the National Alzheimer's Project Act. And in the book, I recount um, the really brilliant um, efforts by the Alzheimer's Association to get this to come to law. But one of the strategic things, though, that was done was to not make it a big public blowout, to not have the president, you know, uh, make a public announcement that, the, by, you know, to a bicameral meeting of the Congress that we're going to take on Alzheimer's. And I think a lot of that had to do with, you know, it's so hard to unite America in, in Washington around a problem, especially if they have to spend money that the better way to do it was to do it quietly. So in summary, you know, when Obama signed that into law for the, to create the National Alzheimer's Project Act, he did it somewhere in Hawaii, just about ready to go on his week-long vacation. And you can't even find a photograph of him signing that into, into, mm. into law. Anyway, what the Project Act calls for is all federal agencies, departments that in some way uh, involve the lives of persons with dementia need to unite together and put together an Alzheimer's plan. And every year we revisit that plan as a nation. Um, and it's beginning to create some coherence around our approach to the disease. And I'll wrap up with the most impressive thing that's occurred was um, substantial increases in the NIH funding for Alzheimer's research, um, such that my colleagues are now, and I now enjoy the ability to get our projects funded and also to train the next generation of researchers and clinicians to take on this problem. And so compared to the way things were five, six years ago, I mean, I'm very optimistic um, and it's all made possible by this National Alzheimer's Project Act, which, again, as you point out, I, I, I got to be kind of maybe self-promoting, but until people read my book, I think most people don't know about it because it just was never promoted. It, it is so interesting. I did read about it in the book, and I was thinking, wow, where have I been? I never knew that that existed. And yeah. it's almost, I, I kind of feel like it's a shame that it wasn't publicized. Again, it's only through transparency that we take away some of the stigma associated with the disease. It's out yeah. there. Let's not pretend that it isn't out there, and let's quantify the cost. I think that that's also part of this, Jason. We have to make it crystal clear how much money our economy is losing because of this disease. It is billions and billions of dollars. And, you know, again, I the most recent example is COVID. There isn't one corporation, there isn't even one agency. University of Pennsylvania is not going to be able to solve this problem by themselves. We need yeah. just the massive amount of energy, intellect, and money to attack this head on. One of the problems about the cost of Alzheimer's disease, which is really better said as the cost of dementia mm -hmm. to America, is that it engages the politics of welfare because the way that you get to the triple digit billion dollar per year cost of this disease is not the cost to the healthcare system meaning the cost of drugs scans hospital visits etc the way you get to the triple digit billion dollar annual cost is if you take the work of a caregiver a daughter a wife a husband occasionally a son and you say how many hours a week did you spend giving care to your relative? And they give you that number. And then you say, well, if that was a job, how much would you be paid to do it? And once you assign a wage to the labor of caregiving, 
and you add up across all the caregivers doing caregiving, that's the triple digit billion dollar figure people talk about. The problem, of course, is that that engages the politics of welfare, because that's saying that the work of a caregiver is work that ought to be compensated and counted. And in America, there's some real differences about that. There are some people who think, well, that's just what families should do. That's a family mm -hmm. problem. We're not going to deal with that problem. Um, or you have to be poor enough, and then we'll finally step in and help you out to do that problem. And, and as long as that's the kind of conversation that you have, you're unable to have an honest conversation of American workers are less productive and or the American family's savings are being taken up by this disease because you're caught up in people saying – that's welfare issues and we don't, you know, welfare is socialism and all these other things. And then you find yourself lost in this bizarre political conversation where helping people with Alzheimer's and their families threatens socialism to America. And you're like, wait a minute, how did we arrive at this bizarre conversation that our liberty will take be taken away by caring for people with dementia? Our liberty is being taken away by Alzheimer's disease, right. <laughs> not right. by trying to help them. And yet, you know, socialism is this sort of, you know, thing that we have to fear i'm like this has nothing to do with socialism and and yet that's the conversation that we have so you know until we break that kind of rhetorical logjam we're caught in this kind of just it's almost kind of darkly comic com political conversation it's it's weird that's what it is i mean i cannot even yeah. believe that people could frame it in that way you know it well that's is... been the rhetoric though oh. the rhetoric since the 80s was um and Actually, for much of the rhetoric around expanding uh, public welfare was uh, uh, sidetracked into conversations about socialism wow. and the threats of a um, socialist takeover. I mean, the American Medical Association opposed Medicare um, and many politicians backed this because they feared if you'd have if you have Medicare, that Medicare will lead to a communist takeover of America. I mean, Ronald Reagan at the time he was an actor in the 1960s did a PSA record, not, it was actually a record, um, in a project that the AMA sponsored called Operation Coffee Cup. And I recount in the book how uh, then actor Reagan was warning the AMA wives, if, if, if Congress passes what would come to be called Medicare, that's going to be lead to socialist takeover of America. I mean, you, be, you look, look at this, you have to sort of laugh because, wow. you know, it was bizarre. But yet that was the conversation. And yet that same kind of conversation continues today. I mean, the opposition to many of the infrastructure improvements that are proposed in the stimulus package, infrastructure package is, well, this will be socialism. And I, I just kind of shrug my shoulders and say, well, but, but who's going to take care of these problems? Right. These are big problems. They right. can't be left to the American family to solve. It is so, so interesting. I think, you know, I'm reminded, and I've got your book in front of me, Jason, I'm reminded of this comparison that you uh, made with, you know, solving, you know, polio and other comparisons. And I'll just read this. We could, we could basically do that for Alzheimer's, colleagues chide me. Build more memory centers, nursing homes, and adult day activity centers. Noodle our way to better team-based care. Set our hospital cell phones to vibrate at night. Or they insist we could just cure this damn disease. Yeah, and, the, and they go to polio and they say, look at that with polio. You know, we could have built more iron lungs and everything else, but instead we discovered the vaccine and polio became a thing of the past. Assuming, of course, someone who has the polio vaccine hidden in the vault doesn't release it mm. and people get vaccinated, uh, mm. witness current problems with COVID. Anyway, the problem with that sort of we're going to drug our way out of this problem make it like polio, a disease of the past. The problem with that is every bit of the science is showing us that the many diseases that cause dementia are just that. There are many different diseases. And just like there are many routes to developing cancer, depending on the organ, you know, we certainly have made progress in cancer and heart disease with, with therapies. But the notion that we'll never have any heart disease or cancer is just not rational policymaking to say that's how we'll solve the problem of cancer and heart disease. And it's the same thing, I think, with this disease. We absolutely should expect progress in developing effective therapeutics such that some people don't experience disabling dementia. Others experience it slower. But sadly, some still don't respond to the therapies, you can't get them, whatever it may be. And that's how we have to think about this disease. So the idea of quote, curing Alzheimer's, it's rhetorically powerful. It motivates people. There's no question. But I think we have to have a more rational approach that says, how can we more effectively treat this disease? 
drugs are part of the solution, but they are not the only part of the solution. So since you brought up the drugs, I'd love to hear what you think about Biogen's drug and, and, and the controversy that is now surrounding it. What do you think? Well, you know, I think that the drug should still be available, but only with the, after a patient signs an informed consent form to enroll in a research study to finally establish, does this drug actually slow the progression of Alzheimer's disease? Unfortunately, FDA didn't see it that way and decided that based on the data Biogen presented them, data that has yet to be published, that the FDA would grant Biogen the ability to sell the drug, although still requiring, quote, a confirmatory study to establish whether the drug, in fact, benefits patients. They did this because they wanted the drug available, because patients are desperate, nothing else is available. I get the argument, but I think most in the field were a little aghast when they saw the FDA's decision, because we were really making progress with this drug and other drugs to establish whether drugs like aducanumab change the natural history of the disease. But FDA went ahead and sort of jumped the line and said, let's make it available, and uh, but continue doing studies of it. Well, trying to do a study of a drug like that when it's available commercially is a little difficult to do. Plus, it sets now an evidence bar that is lower for other drugs out there. So, you know, I, I many of us in the field were very frustrated. We really were making progress with drug discovery. Aducanumab actually may be effective, but the data that were out there just don't really show that to the level that I think were necessary to prescribe it. But FDA didn't see it that way. And now we have this kind of mess that a drug is available with questionable data. And at the same time, we still need to do studies to establish whether that drug is actually effective, as well as other drugs that are like it. And I think the field finds this an extremely frustrating situation. So if I hear you right, because it is available to do a study, you know, one group having the placebo and another group getting the drug or however you're running these studies, you can't do it as effectively? Is that oh, what yeah. you're saying? I mean, I mean, and let's not, you know, I mean, the patients with dementia, uh, patients with Alzheimer's shouldn't be, have to bear this cross, which is, well, do you want to, if you qualify for the drug based on severity, do you want to get the drug clinically or would you want to enroll in a clinical trial that will help other people and you may or may not get it. I, I mean, it's just, you know, making mm. people make that choice is bizarre. I see. The other problem, though, is you're putting out a drug that you, the FDA admits, the evidence is at best provocative that it may actually alter disease course. But FDA's argument was we can lower the standard of evidence because there's a regulatory mechanism in place for serious and life threatening diseases. Alzheimer's is one of them that allows a drug to be put into practice. Uh, on the basis of a weaker standard of evidence. And I think many in the field felt this, the evidence here didn't even rise to that. Mm. More research was needed. And I know you say, well, of course, a physician at the University of Pennsylvania would say more research is needed. That's what you guys and gals do. And my pushback is no, 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 no. I know what this disease is like. I have this disease going on right now in my family. And yet this was not the for a big, vast, large disease as this, as complicated as it is, it was premature to put this drug out into the marketplace. It needed more study. It's going to be difficult to do that study. And the FDA's new evidentiary standard threatens that drugs will be put into practice on the basis of evidence that can't let me confidently say to a patient, this drug is worth its risks and it's worth its costs. And I think for many in the field, it's an extremely frustrating situation that we find ourselves in. Is it something that can be undone? Well, <laughs> um, future drugs, we'll see what stand. I mean, there's a very there's a drug, for example, that Eli Lilly has called called Denanumab. Denanumab is a promising drug. We were all very excited about the data that were published in the New England Journal of Medicine in May of 2020, uh, 2021, excuse me. Um, but then now FDA said lowered the evidentiary standard. We're like, well, wait a minute, does this mean you're not going to do the confirmatory trial we all really want to see? Or are you going to let that trial happen, please? And so that's where I think the field's all kind of worried right now, um, that all these, both aducanumab and denanumab and lecanumab, all these drugs that are showing promising signals are getting out there too damn quickly. And that's a real problem to be able to study them and tell patients they, they're effective and to tell society they're worth the cost because these drugs are expensive yeah. and a lot of people could take them. As I recall, I could be wrong on this, Jason, but isn't it true that when Biogen first went to the FDA with Biogen, they did it at lower doses and the FDA did not approve it? And then later on, they bumped up the doses. They were 
trying to fool around with that. And that's when the FDA finally said, OK, you can start. Well, it's a, the, the, the relationship between FDA and Biogen around this drug is uh, is to be better understood. And in fact, Janet Woodcock, the acting commissioner of FDA, has called for an Office of Inspector General investigation to look at cl- more closely the relationship between FDA employees and Biogen. We'll wait to see what that investigation shows. It, and the fact that she had to call for that raises real concerns about the nature of the relationship that FDA uh, officials had with the company. They were close, but maybe too close is, is the concern. Mm-hmm. Um, bottom line, you know, um, the studies that Biogen did that led up to the data that are available had a lot of decisions made that were more driven by business than science. Move things along quickly, get things done um, without spending a lot of money. And I get the perspective of a company. I can't fault a company for doing what companies do. Um, but on the other hand, it didn't serve the science as well as it could have. And you're right. One of the issues was they leapt into phase three without really good data around dosing. And so they had to amend the protocol um, to change dosing regimens um, in the middle of the, of the phase three studies, introducing variance and noise in the data. And then the other thing they did was they threw a futility analysis into the study. They said, well, what the heck is that? Basically, a futility analysis lets you decide whether there's no chance this study will work. And if that's the case, you just stop it and say, I'm not going to keep the study going. It costs me money. And why should I spend money on something that has no chance of working within certain levels of probability based on how the analyses are conducted? Biogen did that. And in fact, they did the futility analyses. The futility analysis said it's not going to work, but likely. So they shut the study down. More data rolls in. They analyze that data. Guess what? It works, but not in one study, but not the other. And what you're left with is just like a forehead slap of this didn't Mm. have to happen. This Mm. didn't have to happen. These were business decisions. And, you know, um, I'm pro drug. I mean, I want I'm alive because of drugs. Early in my life, I had a very bad illness. And I would say I have family members who are alive because of drugs or living well because of them. It's not about being pro or anti pharma. It's about being smart about how we use our pharma uh, um, uh, technology and businesses to develop drugs. And I think there's a lot of concern with the aducanumab decision that something's going awry at FDA and they're making decisions that no longer serve the public health. Very interesting. So, so in addition, or aside from the issue of drug treatments, what else can be done to improve the lives of people who have been diagnosed with dementia and or Alzheimer's? Well, first, let's get them diagnosed. First, yes. let's get them diagnosed. Mm-hmm. So first, we need to create a national network of, uh, uh, of, of uh, centers for adult cognitive disorders where folks can go and uh, get evaluated and get a diagnosis um, uh, an answer, which may be a diagnosis, maybe not be a diagnosis. COVID has taught us that we can use telemedicine approaches for some of this, so we don't have to have a center in every urban area, but maybe there's ways to interconnect them. So we need centers that can get people a diagnosis. And then we need to begin to deliver the standard of care. No one should be diagnosed with dementia caused by Alzheimer's, Lewy body disease, whatever the disease may be, no one should get a diagnosis of that and not get education and training for how to identify the common problems, make a plan, and access the services and supports they need. So we should do that. And then back to your industry, we need to get your industry talking with my industry, you know, because you gals and guys are on the front line oftentimes of detecting things. And how could we begin to learn from each other in, about what's going on with a client so that rather than just waiting for the disaster, some effort can be made to intervene and talk. So that's another area of of progress. More generally, technology holds a lot of uh, possibilities for us to live better with this disease. I mean, you know, one of the reasons why in my family I'm able to sort of make sure things are okay with a family member is I have online view-only access to a variety of accounts, you know, so I can tell when there's problems going on or not. Well, that's because of technology. So too with the car, you know, monitoring the location of the car. There's a host of ways that technology can allow us to maintain our independence in the community. Um, and these are all things we can do now. You know, everything I've described is we just have to muster the will to do it. You know, it's interesting as you were talking, I was thinking, boy, you know, even something as, you know, maybe feel invasive, but cameras, you know, throughout the house or, you know, yeah. alarms, things of that, things of that nature. Um, you know, I was, uh, I, I have a dear friend who uh, is at an MIT and they have, um, you know, the MIT Age Lab and I'm on the board mm-hmm. there and it's 
fascinating to me some of the things that MIT is coming up with to help people in these later stages of life, whether they're they have Alzheimer's or dementia or not. Um, carpeting that can sense when someone has fallen. It's just, I just think the yeah. whole area is so interesting. And to your point, you know, we may not get a cure, quote unquote, a cure in our lifetime, but we sure can band together and find a better way of approaching this awful disease. It's just exactly. got to be the the the. The, the American will banding together and working together to figure out a solution and help to improve the lives of, of the patients and the families that are dealing with this. Yeah, um, no, I mean, I mean, a big, vast national problem um, requires us to reach back to some of our core values. You know, united we stand, divided we fall. Um, and, you know, I know that sounds rhetorically cute. But I think, you know, we've lived through a period of time in recent history, recent time. It's not yet history because I guess mm -hmm. history has to be 30 years old to be history. But anyway. Oh, I didn't know that. Of... That's interesting. Yeah, technically, what makes something history? It happened mm. 30 years ago or more. But anyway, whatever. That's that's a convention of the field. But, you know, we've lived through times where, you know, we seem to think that the way to advance is to divide. Um, and I just think that this is the kind of disease where that's just not a, a, a useful approach. Right. Uh, so, you know, um, it's it requires leadership. Yeah, I agree with you. It's fine to debate. Sometimes having opposing opinions, you know, together you come up with ultimately a better solution. But as long as we are focused on the solution, working together um, to come up with ideas and alternatives, that's the key. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, for example, more just a couple more solutions here while we, you know, yeah. know we're coming come to the end here. I don't want to. But, you know, we have to rethink the way we run residential long term care. Um, you know, I, I, no one wants to, quote, live in a nursing home. But the fact of this disease is for many patients, there does come a point where home no longer works. The space that they called home for a variety of reasons. And I think it's just simply folly to think that all long term care should should be and can only be delivered in the home. Certainly, it should be and should be available, but we also need to recognize there's a role for people to move to a residence, a place that they can now call home that's different than the home they were in. The problem is, is the stereotype is the nursing home, and yeah, right. many of them are awful, but they're not awful by their what they by the nature of being residential long-term care. They're awful because we've never invested in um, uh, the resources needed and the regulations needed um, and the ownership structures needed to create long-term care facilities that actually deliver long-term care services and supports. So again, that's another thing that can be solved right now. We just have to muster the will to do it. I mean, many of the owners of nursing homes own them because they're great investments of property and they're not really, they don't really care what the hell goes on inside of it. I mean, can you imagine if hospitals were run that way? Like I own this hospital because it's a great real estate investment and I'm trying to do everything I can to cut costs to continue to profit from that. That's the reality with nursing homes in America today. That's it, bizarre. Yeah, you know, it, it's really interesting. Wouldn't it be interesting if we approach this the same way we approach, as you say, hospitals or even schools? I mean, yeah. there's some pretty nice schools out there, and kids are learning. It's a it's a really interesting alternative approach. I also loved uh, there was a part in your book where you discussed, you know, the, the concept of home. And you, you said that home is where the heart is. And I loved that comment. I love that quote because it is so true. And people with Alzheimer's and dementia, they don't really know where home is. They don't well, they can begin to lose that. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And, and yeah. so... Um, and I, I, I will I will end with the one story that you told about uh, Justice Sandra Day O'Connor. In fact, it, you can tell it if 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 you'd like. Um, yeah. Well, you know, the, Justice Sandra Day O'Connor's husband um, had Alzheimer's disease. He had dementia caused by Alzheimer's disease. The justice herself now recently announced about a year or two ago that she herself has Alzheimer's. Um, she 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 retired from the Supreme Court in order to care for her husband. There good, you go. good example of the impact of Alzheimer's on the American family and our productivity. The Supreme Court justice stepped down in order to care for her husband. Mm. Okay. So there came a time in the course of his disease, not uncommon, sadly, where he reached a stage of disability where home was no longer working. The home they were in, he was too disabled 
He required too much intensive supervision and care that it just wasn't working anymore for Justice O'Connor and the family to do that at home. And so they moved him to a new home, to to what we would call a nursing home, a long-term care facility, an institutional setting. Well, you know, in that setting, he met another person, another patient, uh, another resident, another resident, and they developed a relationship. Um, and as that relationship developed, he became actually calmer and, 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 and better accustomed to the environment. And frankly, you know, it was a private matter that became public because the O'Connor is obviously a public figure, but the family was willing to uh, confirm that that indeed had happened and that they were letting it happen, that they were understanding that their father had found a relationship that was working for him in his new home that was going to let him live comfortably. And so they did what I think is the right thing to do is within the boundaries of coercion and other things, they let it happen as opposed to breaking them up and separating them and whatnot. And I, I think I tell that story not because I think it's a happy story or a sad story, but it's a story about life. And life is a mix of the happy and the sad. And the sooner we see that that's what this disease presents, you know, I think the sooner we're going to be able to live with it. All disease is bad by definition. If it wasn't bad, it wouldn't be a disease. This disease is uniquely bad. And I think we have to be honest in the ways that we think we are best to live with it and not pretend that we can drug it away or ignore it or all the other approaches that are just not very productive approaches. Fantastic. Well, Jason Karlowitz, I don't know what to say. You have so exceeded my hopes and <laughs> expectations for this podcast. I have learned so much today, and I'm so grateful for your expertise and how you laid things out. I've learned so much, and it really I gets my juices fired up to see what I can do personally to move these things forward. You know, it's just one person and then another person and yet another. So um, I'm Well, thank you, Patty. Grateful it really means to a lot. You. To hear that from you. We're both in we're both in Pennsylvania. I hope that we can keep in touch. I mean it when I tell you I'm happy to step in and help any way that I can. Well, thank you very much. That means a lot to me. I really appreciate wow. that. And greetings to all your listeners. And if people want to learn more about the book and my writing, they can and the other work I do, they can visit my website, which is jasoncarlowish.com. And I will tell you, I'm holding up the book as we speak on this video. It is literally amazing, just chock full of information. And it's also inspiring because there are solutions. And, you know, there's no one better to lead that charge than Dr. Jason Carlowish. So well, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much for spending this time with me today and and with all of our listeners. And th- thanks to you for tuning in. I hope this was helpful. If you have any questions, please go to our website at keyfinancialinc.com. In the meantime, stay safe, stay healthy, and know there are people out there who are willing to help. Thanks so much for tuning in. Take care.